I cast another discussion, another dense thinkers trying to figure things out. Yes, sir. Here we have <laughs> the man himself who just squatted five plates for Power fucking low. reps. Four reps. Two. Two reps. <laughs> great, great achievement. <laughs> you know, like how I squeeze that in there? Yeah, I did it for reps, dude. Yeah, two. <laughs> I did it for mad reps. You wouldn't even understand. More than one, but less than now, three. <laughs> Sorry. What are we going to be discussing today, huh? Brother, my fellow children of the Nietzsche, uh, pursuers of the Ubermensch, we are talking about a lovely section, excuse me, that he himself has preached many a time before. If you had read the gay science, you would have come across this passage before. We are discussing the spirit of gravity. This was Nietzsche's attested true devil. This is the thing that brought him in his life the most amount of misery. To briefly describe the spirit of gravity as told in the portion of the gay science, which is also a book we highly recommend. Nietzsche poses the question of a entity coming to you in the middle of the night and asking you how would you feel if you had to live this life exactly how you lived it over and over for all of eternity. With every decision, every fart, every spider in the moonlight, how, it, how it's happened and transcended now will always happen. And you have two options, or at least he's, he proposes two options. One, you will... Uh, Throw yourself on the ground. Curse this entity for being Satan himself, for cursing you to an eternity of hell because you regret the decisions you've made. Or the other side of the coin, people, is that you will be so grateful to the spirit. You will have think that this spirit is God telling you this because you lived your life exactly how you want to live it and how you're going to live it. This, to break it down simply, uh, is not an idea original to him. This has been in many cultures and civilizations before, like the uh, Egyptians, the eternal reoccurrence in Viking mythology with Yongmonder, the giant snake that consumes the world and it eats its own tail. Uh, so it's not original, but he does have a fresh, hot take on it. So how do you feel about that, Ryan? A little intro. I thought that was great. And I think uh, it's just important to understand that no matter how strong your perspective is, that it's just based on your uh, like nature and nurture of like what you've experienced and what you've seen that leads you to this uh, you know this point where you believe a certain thing because you know a, a truly healthy human will think you know like different things ten years from now because that's like growth and evolution and and learning and understanding so I think it's important to try and like you know have two different perspectives like i think i saw this uh post which was kind of rubbish but it was like a, a father who was an alcoholic and two of his sons they were one of them was a drunk and the other was a successful businessman and they asked the two brothers why what happened in their life to bring them to that point and the drunk said my father was an alcoholic so he accepted his fate or uh, the uh, disease or, or whatever it is, he accepted, he looked at his father and the perspective was, oh, our, we're a family of drunks. And then the son, who was a successful businessman, they asked him why his life turned out that way. And he said, because my father was a drunk. Mm -hmm. So two different perspectives, two different paths. But I think it's important to understand uh, like both both paths or try and put yourself in two different people's shoes because like like they uh, seem so or i well i was just gonna say the like how black and white everything is now and it doesn't seem there's a gray area like you're either bad or good mm -hmm. so it's like ha like we're all so similar like we all have like uh you know th uh, sinful ways or sh shame about things or like um no one's perfect is what i'm trying to say so it's like you know, people idealize people who are perfect and all of this, and it's like, follow your own path, have your own understanding, and don't just fall into, like, the crowd, I guess, you know? Mmm, be your own special snowflake. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Crap. 
crazy. Um, all right, so I think that was a pretty good introduction, everybody, to the spirit of gravity and a nice example by our friend, our good friend and dear Ubermensch Ryan. So let us get on with a reading. Shall I start? Yeah, you can start off. All righty. My glib tongue is of the people. I speak too coarsely and warmly for silky rabbits, and my words sound even stranger to all inky fish and scribbling foxes. My hand is a fool's hand. Woe to all tables and walls and whatever has room left for fool scribbling. Fool's doodling. My foot is a horse's foot. With it I trot and trample uphill, down dale, hither and thither, over the fields, and am the devil's own for joy when I am out at a gallop. My stomach, is it perhaps an eagle's stomach? For it likes lamb's flesh best of all. But it is certainly a bird's stomach, nourished with innocent and few things, ready and impatient to fly, to fly away. That is my nature now. How should there not be something of the bird's nature in it? And especially bird-like is that I am enemy of the spirit of gravity, and truly mortal enemy, arch enemy, born enemy. Oh, where has my enmity uh, not flown and strayed already? I could sing a song about that, and I will sing one, although I am alone in an empty house and have to sing it to my own ears. There are other singers, to be sure, whose voices are soft, er, softened, whose hands are eloquent, whose eyes are expressive, whose hearts are awakened. Only when the house is full, I am not one of them. He who will one day teach men to fly will have moved all boundary stones. All boundary stones will themselves fly into the air to him. He will baptize the, new, the earth anew as the weightless. The ostrich runs faster than any horse, but even he sticks his head heavily into heavy earth. That is what the man who cannot f uh, yet fly is like. He calls earth and life heavy, and so will the spirit of gravity have it. But he who wants to become light and a bird must love himself. Thus do I teach. Not with the love of the sick and deceased, to be sure. For with them, even self-love stinks. One must learn to love oneself with a sound and healthy love, so that one may endure it with oneself and not go roaming about. Thus do I teach. Such roaming about calls itself love for one's neighbor. These words have been up to now the best for lying and dissembling, and especially for those who are oppressive to everybody. And truly, to learn to love oneself is no commandment for today or tomorrow. For rather, it is art and finest, subtlest, ultimate, and most patient of all. For all his possessions are well concealed from his possessor. And all the treasure pits one's own is the last to be digged. The spirit of gravity is the cause of that. Almost in the cradle are we presented with heavy words and values. This dowry calls itself good and evil. For its sake we are forgiven for being alive. And we suffer little children to come to us to prevent them in good time from loving themselves. The spirit of gravity is the cause of that. And we, we bear loyally what we have been given upon hard shoulders over rugged mountains and when we sweat we are told yes life is hard to bear but only man is hard to bear that is because he bears too many foreign things upon his shoulders like a camel he kneels down and lets himself be well laden especially the strong weight-bearing man in whom dwell respect and awe he has laden too many foreign heavy words and values upon himself now life seems to him a desert and truly many things that are one's own are hard to bear too. And much that is intrinsic in man is like the oyster, that is loathsome and slippery and hard to grasp, so that a noble shell and noble embellishments must intercede for it. But one has to learn this art as well, to have a shell and a fair appearance and a prudent blindness. Go ahead, Ryan. Again, it is deceptive about many things in man that many a shell is inferior and wretched and too much of a shell. Much hidden goodness and power is never guessed at. 
the most exquisite dainties fa find no tasters. Women, or the most exquisite of them, know this. A little fatter, a little thinner. And how much fate lies in so little. Man is difficult to discover, most of all to himself. The spirit often l tells lies about the soul. The spirit of gravity is the cause of that. But he has discovered himself who says that is my good and evil. He has silenced thereby the mole and dwarf who says, Good for all, evil for all. Truly, I dislike also those who call everything good, and this world the best of all. I call such people the all-contented, all-contentedness that knows how to taste everything. That is not the best taste. I honor the obstinate, fastitious tongues and stomachs that have learned to say I and yes and no. But to chew and digest everything, that is to have a really swinish nature. Always to say yeah, only the ass and those like him have learned that. Deep yellow and burning red, that is to my taste. It mixes with blood with all colors. But he who whitewashes his house and betrays to me a whitewashed soul. One loves mummies, the other phantoms, and both alike enemy to all flesh and blood. Oh, how both offend my taste, for I love blood. And I do not want to stay and dwell where everyone spews and spits. That is now my taste. I would rather live among thieves and perjurers. No one bears gold in his mouth. More offensive to me, however, are all licks and the most offensive beast of a man I ever found. I baptized Parasite. It would not love, yet wanted to live by love. I call wretched all who have only one choice to become an evil beast or an evil tamer of beasts. I would build no tabernacles among these men. I also wretched those who have always have to wait. They offend my taste. All tax collectors and shopkeepers and kings and other keepers of lands and shops. Truly, I too have learned to wait. I have learned it from the very heart, but only to wait for myself. And above all, I have learned to stand and to walk and to run and to jump and to climb and to dance. This, however, is my teaching. He who wants to learn to fly must first learn to stand, and to walk and to run and to climb and to dance. You cannot learn to fly by flying. With rope ladders I learned to climb to many a window. With agile legs I climbed up high mass to sit upon mass of knowledge seemed to me no small happiness. To flicker little flames upon high mass a little light to be sure, but yet a great comfort to cast away sailors and the shipwreck. I came to my truth and by diverse paths and in diverse ways. It was not upon a single ladder that I climbed to the height where my eyes survey my distances. And I have asked the way only unwilling that has always offended my taste. I have rather questioned and attempted the ways themselves. All my progress has been an attempting and questioning and truly one has to learn how to answer such questioning. That, however, is to my taste. Not good taste, not bad taste, but my taste. Which I no longer conceal, and of which I am no longer ashamed. This is now my way. Where is yours? Thus I answered. Those who ask me the way for the way does not exist. Thus spoke Zarathustra. Oh my god, what an eloquent ending to such a beautiful section. My god, that was fantastic. I love That's the, good, my guy. I dude That's good. I love the ending there. His interpretations of again the uh, fact that there are no there is no objective truth essentially other than the truth of your own and you have to create it your own. And how he says that you not only have to ask the questions but you have to answer the questions. So where does it come from? 
where do these answers come from? They come from deep within yourself. Great point. Great point. And yeah, why don't we we'll, uh, get a little crazy here and start from the end, I guess, and then work our way back. So, yeah, for the way does not exist. But, it, you know, in this page, he tells us um, basically the blueprint of of what the way is you know it's 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 not one ladder that you climb you know you have to do multiple things um you know climbing one ladder at a time until you you know achieve what yourself is meant to achieve and climbing upon these ladders and taking those steps you know, rather than staying in one place, I think that's sort of the symbolism of, of the multiple ladders. And, you know, in order to fly, it's not flying in itself. You know, there's so many things to learn before that place. Yeah, I do. Okay, I do like how you broke down the ladder analogy because I was having trouble understanding the diverse paths. Um, but that makes more sense is that you shouldn't be looking at progress as linear. It shouldn't be from point A to point B in a straight line. But because that's too, too that's too two dimensional. It's more than that. What you're saying is true. Flying um, kind of evokes the imagination to to understand this from a three dimensional problem, and so it's not just flying and like how do I get there from walking. It's understanding all the other things that you can do, like dance, as he says. Um, yeah, to, to learn to stand, to walk, to run, and to climb into dance you cannot learn mm -hmm. to fly by flying that that i think is probably one of the best things i've ever well i mean that's going a little overboard but you can't learn to fly by flying i mean usually you would think that that's not that's 100 percent the wrong way like that's 180 degrees going backwards but in this analogy i get it yeah for sure and Especially now, like our attention spans have gone so low with such rapid speeds of how, you know, information is processed, communication takes place, and all of these things. So, you know, it's such a simple thing, you know, to find yourself, you know, you have to climb these ladders and not just one, take multiple paths. You know, it goes back to what we were saying about perspective, you know, it's like, how are you supposed to develop a perspective if you stay in in the same town where everyone believes the same thing and everyone um you know sort of agrees on the the morality one should have you know explore different cultures different meanings uh you know you can do that through text as well on um you know certain philosophers who come from all around the world their differences and then you know it's i i like you know basically taking one ladder rung at a time and you noticed he said it, it was uh it wasn't a ladder it was a rope ladder wow. and yeah so a rope ladder much more difficult to climb than you know a stationary one made of wood or metal so the the rope ladder uh symbolizing you know sort of that that shakiness you can fall off more easily you know if like a, a, a you slip on a rung and you're you know dangling on this rope ladder and um you know i can almost see like jumping across from one of those rope ladders onto another one you know he's climbed to this high height and then like having to go up onto another ladder jumping across like you know it's um it's no easy feat to to you know uh try and better yourself especially when it's it's so rare uh because people will um you know sort of stick to what they they know right or like you know if all of your friends all they do is go out and party you know that's gonna be the sort of lifestyle that you'll be involved with as well so like the i i mean i guess like the diversifying it's like you can look at like stocks as well like if you're all, all in on one uh, sector of the market you you'll be screwed if there's some bad news but you know diversifying uh your portfolio into different sectors you'll be safe if the, one of them has a crash so it's like that's so important and and finding yourself is is going on these different paths uh n not focusing so much on one but going from one another and, and all of that you know yeah that's i think a strong quality that i have that is specific to like 
some of my uh, personality traits, like being charismatic and everything, is um, I've always been one to kind of be very curious and want to learn about whatever catches my eye. And so by doing so, I'm doing what you're saying in terms of like diversifying the people I'm hanging out with, diversifying the ideas, perspectives, experiences, um, all walks of life. It doesn't matter. I, I have met plenty of people from you know that differ so much not just in like their ideas about the universe but like how their how the divine energy within them expresses themselves you know what i mean whether it's like uh more rational minded people in the business realm or more free flow uh, artistic people in the spiritual and like more hippie oriented realm i'm always looking for like my thirst for new experiences and understanding um brings me to meet a lot of people and diversifies my quote unquote portfolio. And that helps me create the world that I know because you can't have, uh, you can't know exactly who you are or anything about yourself unless you have something to contrast with. So. Yeah, most definitely. And, and uh, you know, that's such an important thing that, you know, what happens in, in times of peace is that, um, you know, people don't have an appreciation for that life and death. So that's why I like, you know, we're built for overcoming situations. So, you know, in times of peace, we, we, we have discussions and, and ideologies that come about that, you know, no one would even consider during the time because people have so much appreciation for life and death. You know, a person from a war-torn countries wouldn't be discussing, you know, um, genders and bathrooms and stuff you know <laughs> they, they're so they got bigger fish yeah. to fry yeah they you know it's like if you're born in a, a war and torn country and all you know is life and death you know is you have so much appreciation for those who um are alive well, and around hold you on now that. let's not over romanticize let's be realistic here um mm -hmm. yes you, what you're saying is true if and only if they survive the crucible of fucking hell because let's remind ourselves they're in a goddamn war-torn country it's not easy to come out of that um and appreciate life there's a lot of contempt and hatred that they have to work through if you think about it well well don't forget think about it this way is if you're born in a country like that that's all you know you don't know well but it's still else. ah but it's still hell like yeah <laughs> sure you might have been born in hell so what else do you know but you fucking know that it's hell you know what i mean you have some semblance of an idea that being bombed is not normal or you know being persecuted based on your belief or the color of your skin is not normal so like um it, it's it's uh, the analogy goes with a lot of different examples but this is one of them which is uh, if, if they are thrown into the deep end. If they learn how to swim, then yeah, they come out great swimmers and they come out like very profound people that, that have worked through that and come out on top. But it is the fucking deep end and there are sharks. So let's not, you know what I mean? I don't want to over romanticize like, oh, these people are so glorious. It's like, not all of them make it, dude. A lot of them fucking, you know, get well, torn up by hell. Well, it, it's not about it being glorious, right? It's just like appreciating being alive you know or i guess you're right you know maybe some of them like they know it's hell and they, they would rather not be alive or you know some cases like that yeah that's what i mean but what, what was the uh the original point here oh okay uh something uh um uh, okay yeah so <laughs> bit of a tangent there but basically the original point i was trying to make was about um happiness and uh sadness you know you can't know one without knowing the other because if you weren't at that high point, you weren't at that low point. And it's like, it's such a dangerous philosophy for someone to like try and find their happiness and be happy 100%. Because life's not easy for anyone, no matter if you're rich or poor. You know, it's like uh, everyone experiences, de you know, death in the family or um, uh, disease or, or some sort of factor that, you know, makes li life wasn't what it was yesterday. It's so different today. Sure. And, um, I, that was what I was kind of talking about having that appreciation like don't have that appreciation when it's too late have that appreciation now and that that's kind of the tie-in I was going to have it's like they don't know in a war-torn country if they're going to live today or tomorrow so it's like their um, interaction with each other is going to be a lot better than someone who's lived in peace all their life and not experienced like a life or death situation yeah the, exactly we, we know for a fact that more likely than not those people are not taking 
the days that God is giving them for granted. Um, if let's tie uh, some of the points you were bringing up about you know happiness and your love for yourself back to an earlier part of this reading where he talks about that. Oh uh, yeah, just before we go on, I have one more point about uh, what's it called? Okay, with a quote. Uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm not like a jack of all trades, but a uh, master of many. Yes. Um, uh, but uh, the real end is um, the ending of it is different, but it's uh, often better than a master of one. So that's why I was tying in with like the perspectives and stuff. It's like if you're a master of something and that's all you know it's like what experiences do you have of like other other lives you know if you've dedicated your whole life to just one specific thing um rather than experiencing like all life has to give or like you know knowing like say in a survival situation it's like knowing like what herbs to eat what um what uh animals whatever you know how to build stuff how, how to do this it requires so much and um that's why I really look up to like Leonardo da Vinci and those type of people who are polymaths who showed that you could be an expert in so many fields, you know? Yeah. For sure. Not just one. Yeah, but let's, uh, you wanted to go back a little bit? Yeah, because what you're talking about, about like finding happiness, finding your truth, uh, which is what he's talking about has to also do um and i think you were talking about it too about find like loving yourself and he brings it up on page 211 where he's saying that you have to learn to love oneself it's no commandment for today or for tomorrow rather it's an art the it's the, uh rather is, is this art the finest subtlest ultimate and most patient of all and um i think it's important so this is something that i've contended with with him and with myself for a while which is like he is a preacher some people would think of hypocrisy based on minimal reading of him because a lot of what he said a, a major preaching of him is to, to have contempt for yourself um but then he also says you have to love yourself and to a lot of people that can be very confusing because you know maybe you're, they're very like uh uh, one-dimensional thinkers and they think oh but he just said you have to have contempt for yourself so you have to kind of hate yourself um, and now he's saying love yourself what is this guy saying well I think it's important again the whole duality of existence um, and why I'm bringing this up is because contempt is just as important as love for your development like he is saying here that it is a fine it's the finest uh, art form of life and how like you will like ultimately create and cultivate a better you is by trusting your instincts um for uh, trusting your instincts through like finding contempt within yourself um or and then learning how to love oneself notice how is how the word learn to love oneself learn is italicized meaning there's an emphasis on it and i think that's it's important that he's specifically using the word learn because he's not saying you have to love yourself and that's it He's saying you have to learn how to love yourself. You have to work through the contempt that you have, that everyone should have of themselves. Be critical of yourself. Um, a lot of people think that that's, you know, there's some therapy and psychologists that disagree and think that that's very harmful. But I think those people are just not strong enough to understand that contempt is like one of the most powerful tools that uh, could possibly be used. It's like maybe it's just me, but contempt is a very powerful tool to help you like kind of bring your ground yourself. You know what I mean? kind of understand well, uh -huh. yeah yeah uh i was just gonna say you know it's like if you want to do something great in this life you're gonna be in a, a a place where people don't understand you know it's like you'll be going so, so hard on that one thing that like people just can't like understand it like uh being uh, obsessive about it or being self-critical it's like how are you supposed to be um improve yourself if you're content with yourself you know it's like if you're if you're just content at step one but you know if uh you know if someone showed you that there was 400 steps you could have achieved in your lifetime you know it's like i think it's very important to be self-critical of oneself but uh not to the point where it's like it's it's harmful to your psyche you know right like you should be you should have 
your uh, a okay. very good healthy relationship with your unconscious and know that okay now it's being now I'm self harming too much and uh, you know it, this is actually counterproductive to my cause. Um, sorry, my I had. I'm trying to recollect a very good thought that I have about contempt and love. I'm missing one part of my thought, but I do have another part. Um, and that is the example of we're going to, I'm going to use the example since it is fight night tonight and it's before my birthday and big Derek, the black beast, my balls was hot. Lewis is fighting my man. And, uh, and it, so I'm going to use I'm going to use Conor McGregor as a powerful example for the importance of contempt and uh, how it will keep you continuously growing, and that is uh, how if you notice if anyone is familiar with Conor McGregor's fighting career, when he had contempt for himself and when he ha was hungry, what he was the most ferocious and best fighter in the weight class, unstoppable. His confidence was f uh, fantastic, but that was because. He had contempt for himself. The way he would talk about himself, um, in terms of like how much better he could be, or and how much better he wanted to be and will be, shows you that he did have contempt. And what happened? What was his ultimate downfall? Like a lot of great people, like a lot of people, like Ronda Rousey, same thing. They achieve this greatness and they get content. They get content. They don't, and they lose the contempt. So, so uh, apologies if it's hard to hear me, but. They become content with their situation. They are no longer contempt with themselves. And then they become dull. And you see that with a lot of people. And so that's uh, an example for stressing the importance of contempt. Very good. Very good. Uh, I'm sort of gravitating towards one section in the spirit of gravity. <laughs> okay. I've just got, that's I kind just of had a, one... That was a funny joke you just made. <laughs> uh yeah so i think there was one more point i wanted to say uh about that last page okay oh we could talk about that last literally the last like half page at the end for so long it's so good i liked how he sort of talked about um i learned how to wait for myself which i think is really important you know, you should have an, you have an understanding much better of yourself than other people. So having that positive consciousness or having that confidence in yourself and your own ability is important. And how do you get that confidence by being competent and being competent uh, is being useful, you know? So how are you being useful to, um, to society in a, in a way? And then um, he says, uh sorry Is it my eyes okay so yeah he says only to wait for myself my eyes survey my distances um so he climbed to that height uh, across those ladders and and all that way to a place where his eyes are surveying the distance uh, you know himself he, he's gone past man and is able to look from um you know, you could almost say like egoless eyes, you know, the truth, um, not manipulated by uh, emotion, um, but true understanding, you know, in a way. That... Uh, I was, sorry, one, one more thing. Uh, I was just going to say the, the flicker of the flames upon high mass, a little light to be sure, but yet a great comfort to castaway sailors and the shipwrecked. Uh, I like, I really like that because it was... You know, um, you know, such a, a small flame can have such a large reach. You know, it's like you don't need that great soaring fire to bring comfort to a uh, a castaway. You know, someone who's you know in a hopeless state on an island by themselves, unsure of a rescue. You know, but that small flame in the distance upon the mast brings you know so much hope that you know. He's not in this everlasting hell, but there's hope in a way. So it's like, you know, you can be that light as well for others. That small flame that has, I think we talked about this before, but that small flame that has such an impact, you know, in being a good influence on others and inspiring 
and they inspire others in themselves and it's like it's such a greater effect than just that one person that and, being, and, and doing the opposite is the same right being a, a darkness and you spread that darkness you know that your breakdown of that was beautiful i actually it didn't really strike me until you just broke it down more that that's what he was <laughs> that that was you what he was saying he's saying look as long as there is even the tiniest bit of hope um, for someone who is metaphorically shipwrecked in their life, that that that's all it takes, and then you can be back out there on the rough oceans of life and striving towards that light. Um, that's definitely because if you think about it again, to go back to Conor McGregor, he wasn't born rich; he was very poor, and uh, his flickering of light as he was down there, you know in you know wherever he grew up I, I don't know where in ireland but i don't think it was that great of an area uh this was his fighting was his that that small flame and look how far it's taken him you know 100 millionaire in the hundreds of millions taken him so far in life met so many great people uh, i'm not saying he's a great individual i kind of hate him but <laughs> but my point still stands is that that little light and that's that's amazing that you also say it's not that little light of, of hope is not just uh, uh, an idea or some metaphysical thing. It's a real life thing. It can be a fucking person. And that's that's very powerful. That's not something to be taken lightly. Yeah, definitely. And, 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 and um, you know, it's like, I, I really enjoy helping others. And it's like, uh, you know, when people are like depressed or whatever, it's like, I uh, that first thing is like, just cl cleaning your room is like so important where it's like, you have the power to control that so it's like make that make that bed and then it's like go on to the next thing because it's like if you spiral into this um uh depression state where it's like you let things build up and then it's like making or maybe even relating it to the flame it's like think you have to be such a flame or a, a bonfire or a, a funeral pyre where it's just this massive flame when all you really need to be is this small flame, you know, and 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 taking small steps that he talks about, and stepping and stepping and stepping, um, you become that that small flame is, it has such a great impact, rather than paralyzing oneself trying to become up on fire, you know, and then not being a light at all. Uh, news flash, everybody, in case you ha in case you're oriented towards this and you haven't figured it out yet. Uh, <laughs> Ryan is an Aquarius, and Aquariuses are the most humanitarian out of all signs in the zodiac. So uh, things make sense now. You know, trying to help others. That's also something within me. Haha, -ha, Aquarius Moon. So go figure. If that's what you're oriented around. But yes, that's uh that side of you that humanitarian that that actually gives a shit about other people and wants to help is something that uh we we definitely and myself included cannot take for granted you are a great friend my friend oh thank you that's very kind ben uh well it's like i think it's like uh ex experiences right like it's like um I think so many people think there's so, so many opportunities or so many times you get to experience, you know, it's like put it off till tomorrow or it's like um, that interaction that you have with someone. It's like you think, oh, I'll just make a better impact next time or something. You may never see that person and then that's that like impact of you. Exactly. Or it's like j just like pr practicing good impact or, or it's um, what was my point here? Uh, yeah, I guess it's like a, 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 exp experiences, right? Like, you know, um, like your first heartbreak, how devastating was that? You know, it's like that absolute crushing sensation of like, oh, no, the world is ending on like your like fourth grade crush or something like that, you know? It's like, and then it's like, um, you know, that sort of lessons. It's like... Um, the Conor McGregor point, it's like he had this hunger, he was like uh, on like food stamps and whatever, and it's like living in the car, and then it's like he's fighting his way to the top, which I, I really, that's why I, I love uh, that sort of competitive, where it's just you, and you're fighting your way to the top, that's probably the pure in a, in a capitalist society, I think that's probably the purest way to become rich you know it's like truly like 
yourself fighting against another person to climb that that rope ladder up you know but it's like um uh winning and then and then extreme wealth and then all of these other things where he is experiencing so much uh pleasure right so much pleasure you know come uh, think of the contrast of being in your car and living in it to being in 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 multi-million dollar mansions and yachts and all of this and and uh you know trying to have that same motivation to, to fight you know it's L like uh, impossible. yeah and and that's why um you know being uh i, I like the contrast between mcgregor and habib you know habib is this very humble person who uh you know uh still like uh humble in life you know just not like in defeat but like humble with ev everyone you know and it's like uh still i think israel on is sort of the same like still washing the gym mats even though they're champion you know staying true to their roots and that's why they stay champion you know they remain humble and they i think they what's a two, probably a ten thousand two thousand year old quote um you know your hu hubris will be your downfall you know allowing um i guess the abyss right the abyss to take over you're allowing the abyss to consume you and um i guess remaining true to your roots but evolving or can you expand upon that at all uh Lysian, Khabib, number one wrestler. Khabib, smash your face. Khabib, the eagle, Nurmagomedov, undefeated, 29-0. and 0. He will smash face. He wants send location. He will come. <laughs> Don't you dare throw a fucking dolly at Khabib's bus. You will literally die. <laughs> um, no, I mean, we could literally go on forever about... Because, like, you know, McGregor, like you said, is... Uh, a really great example because of how documented like a majority of his life is is like look at what happened when he became super successful he became arrogant yeah sure he was the best and but he let it consume him that was his abyss you might you might not think see people get like the term abyss very con construed they're like they they envision like darkness depression like all these really really uh, not favorable things, but they don't also realize like the abyss is also um, arrogance. Like, look at that's that's what consumed McGregor. He was so consumed by the arrogance um, of his greatness, which you know it'd be hard for anyone to not be. Uh, so it's not like I'm bashing him for that. No pun intended, because he literally got his fucking face bashed in by uh, Khabib. But um, but so I'm not railing against him. But what I'm saying is like, look at like observe the situation or your situation in its entirety he was consumed by the abyss of arrogance uh he probably i'm assuming was not as um, not as hungry because again from an instinctual perspective he was succeeding on every level like you know he could uh he could spread his seed wherever he wanted to he had so much money he could eat whatever the fuck he wanted to eat fly wherever he wanted to fly like there was from an instinctual level like there was no need to fight anymore that was it so then he became arrogant and content and then he uh he fucked with the eagle and <laughs> listen the one thing i learned is you can't talk shit about people from dagestan <laughs> mm. so uh yeah I, I think another point which is interesting is like uh, I think, like, you can look at, like, Habib versus Connor. You know, Habib stayed training at the same gym. He, like, still wrestled bears and all that other crazy <laughs> shit, you know? There's a rumor then, that he wrestled Putin. And then, McGre <laughs> <laughs> and then M McGregor is at, like, a top training facility with, like, 50 trainers and, like, all of this. And it's, like, and still loses, you know? It's, like, stay true to your roots. What, what, um, you know, it's, like... Cause what kept you winning Wong? And I, I think the, the contrast was like uh, McGregor and, and Cerrone. Oh. McGregor was like so soft and, and humble and calm and all this. And then I think it, during the uh, the Poirier, he brought back, he was trying to find himself again. To yeah. To find, yeah. you know, his like, his, his old self. He tried, the, that, he tried the God thing for a little bit. That didn't work out. Yeah. <laughs> 
it, yeah, well, think about this. He was Mystic Mac, right? Yeah. All of his predictions were coming true. I'm going to KO you th- this round, this round, this true, round. True, true. He was Mystic Mac, which which led to his downfall because it was an impossible thing, you know? It's like maybe he truly believed it himself or whatever, but it's like if you're creating this aura of invincibility around yourself... Then it's like when your predictions don't come true, then that it, that shows a chink in your armor. You can't create a impenetrable armor on something that cannot be a hundred percent true. You know, it's um, and that's what happened in the Nate Diaz fight. Is that was his downfall? Was he gave Nate Diaz his best punch? He was an absolute dog who, who you could hit with a sledgehammer and still would probably get up, but he his punch didn't work. And, you know, that that aura of invincibility showed a chink in his armor that other fighters utilized. And that's when, you know, he started losing. You're talking about the first matchup? Because I, I forget who he fought. Because yeah. who did he fight, Nate or Nick? I think he fought Nick. No, maybe Nate, no, Nate is there. Nate. It was Nate Diaz. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah and he uh, beat he, him, and he was vegan. <laughs> yeah, I was like, bro, could. get slapped up by him. Like, literally, because that's all he does. He does slap, so I was literally like... Get slapped up by a vegan, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it, he couldn't knock him out. I think it went five rounds, or Nate submitted him, and then the second fight was five rounds. So it's like he he was a knockout artist and didn't right. knock this guy out, you know? That's right. And that probably psychologically affected him, and it's like, it's, uh, it's tough putting yourself in that position, you know? But it's like what you signed up for, so... Yeah. Uh, you, you reap what you sow, um, this too shall pass. There's a lot of different you know sayings that we could write in a fucking book that uh but enough about some ginger fuck who's not relevant anymore um do you have anything else good sir because we touched on quite a few good subjects there and uh we're getting close we passed the 45 minute mark so uh i know you gotta go to the yeah uh yeah there was one point where he said i would rather spend time with uh thieves oh um yeah, yeah, as he, opposed to the, uh, the the toxic religious people, right? Uh, I think it was just like the... I think it was like just normal people. He would rather spend time with actual thieves and uh, crooks rather than normal people or, or wealthy people or whatever. Because their inten- you know their intentions. So it's like, mm. you know, the, the rich people will smile in your face and, and stab, stab you in, in the, the back. back. Stab you in the back and it's like the thieves you already know uh they're a monster or whatever and yeah, it's like, yeah that's why that's why it's scary when people um when someone who's like very attractive or charismatic and they turn out to be a killer because like w- in our heads you expect you would know who a killer is by so, the yeah, way they look shout and, out the, to and the sorry, the, uh, the way they are and uh what's it called so at least the thieves with you know they don't they don't flash like they're gold and have the gold in their mouth and and um, um, uh, you know trying to spread their wealth. You know that they they take and and they uh, you know sort sort of live that, that uh, humble life of like hiding your wealth, blending in with the crowd and not being like flashy and seen and and all of this and being wearing a mask that isn't true to themselves. They are thieves. They steal. They're bad people. And you know that, you know? Yeah, that's a very good point. Because um, oftentimes, when you don't know someone's true nature, you know, and they're acting like a snake, but in the worst way, uh, very deceptive and manipulative and uh, two-faced and all the, all of that garbage, um, it's hard to expect. So it's hard to kind of like... It's almost like you, you can induce psychosis because you don't know what to expect. You're I don't know if you experience this, but like I've had to like, with people, play multiple different roles with them uh and play like different fields like i'll play one field where i respond as if like what they're saying is true and that they're being like you know they're trying to help me and then i'll be trying to also play the other field which is like oh but be careful because him saying this or she saying this might also she's probably also trying to sabotage this and you know what i mean is that relatable yeah 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 for sure and uh i went to many different schools so i was always like having to adapt to the people around me and you know um sort of don a, a mass with different groups and that's why i like hanging out with different people to experience different things but uh um it's sort of like um that tribe tribalist 
instinct that people have. So it's like if you're not of the norm or there's always a wariness around them. So it's like adopting to your surroundings and and uh, it's like if someone offers you a drink and you refuse, there's that sort of awkwardness because it's like you don't drink and it makes them feel uncomfortable or something like that. You know, it's like a sober person going out with a bunch of people like to drink and they're trying to like force them to drink and be like, you know, it's like that disparity of like levels. Like they don't want to feel bad for drinking because it's normal for everyone to drink. And I guess you could talk about a whole point about how people normalize things that aren't good for them to make it feel like it's a good thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good point. That's uh, uh birds birds of a feather flock together people. Whoever you surround yourself with will your environment influences you. Nature and uh, nature um, as in your genetics, but also nurture as in your environment. So it does have an effect on you people. Be be aware of your environment and what you surround yourself with. Yeah, there's a, uh, you know, so, uh, that path of light, I think he talks about somewhere, and, um, you know, to walk a path shrouded in darkness that constantly wishes, you know, for you to, um, to fail at achieving that light and extinguish your flame, um, fighting through this you know it's like the people who want to bring you back you know if you're trying to become a better person and they don't want you because then you know they would feel inclined to be a better person or protecting their ego of like it's okay to be in this place that i'm in so it's like the people who try and bring you back or the societal influences that are stopping you from achieving your true self if you can walk through that path where you're shrouded in darkness trying to become a light you know, covered in shadows, you know, at the end of that path, you'll find that light and be able to fight the dragon, you know? <laughs> yep, very true. Uh, yeah, so he talks a lot about flying, and uh, I guess for me, the symbolism of that was, you know, obviously not physically fly, but, uh, you know, to soar past the depraved man. Uh, and soar above man to become a better version um, of yourself and and achieve you know a sort of enlightenment and acceptance of your life and your fate and be proud of the life you're living uh, you know it's you know how many thousands of years have philosophers tried to have a, uh, uh, a, a like sort of a understanding of what life is and you know i feel like it's so overcomplicated but it's very simple in just like finding your purpose and 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 following that you know your purpose in life to find your purpose and uh you know it's like the yin and yang sign everything must be in perfect balance you know it's like there must be good there must be evil there must be all of these things these contrasts to actually have fulfillment in the ch overcoming a difficult task. If there's no adversity, then how can you feel satisfaction of achieving something, you know? Yeah. It's like uh, in video games, cheaters, right? It's like um, you're not overcoming everything, you have such an advantage, or someone who is 250 pounds of muscle versus a 100 pound 14 year old kid, you know? It's like it, there's such everyone knows the outcome of that you know there must be balance and finding that moral code finding your moral code or as he says uh you know this is now my way where is yours you know it's like there is no answer to the path you know if you're seeking answers to life's life's uh, meaning and questions you've got to find that for yourself and you know it's like no teachings or or, or something you can buy, you know? It's not that you have, that you can't sell, that you can't buy, that you have for yourself. Your own moral code, your own path that you're following, you're climbing the rope ladders, even if you're scared, and, um, you know, achieving what you were meant to achieve. Or in another sense, at the end of your life, you can be proud of what you've done, that you, you know, you may have not, reached the top rung of the top ladder but at least you attempted the climb 
rather than being paralyzed by fear. Yeah, staring up the mountain. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh I think that's good, man. Do you do you have any more points you wanna bring up about this? I mean we could talk about it for much longer, obviously. Um, yeah, the only thing I and it might it might be a, a long conversation, but the only thing but I'll 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 risk it. The only other thing that he dis not the only other thing, but one of the things that he discusses in this section that I really liked and I can tie it into a lot of other discussions that he's brought up before is the to go back to what you're saying about flying, um <clears throat> flying implies again if we're thinking about things in terms of gravity like a weightlessness uh think about in the biblical sense what are angels they are these heavenly figures depicted in like light robes they're depicted with wings floating above the earth very light figures uh and then he how it relates to him is that what he's saying is you as uh, you know as the camel in at, at a certain point in your life are determining how much you are burdening yourself with and the more things you burden with yourself especially what he's saying the more foreign things you're burdening with yourself that you don't need they're not nece they're not necessity towards you um, the heavier things get and then boom, you are weighed down by the seriousness of life and you're unable to be lighthearted and fly amongst the angels. So I think that's a very powerful analogy and point of discussion to talk about. Um, because again, his devil is the spirit of gravity. It's this, it's, uh, more specifically, he brings it up actually in the next section he goes, the spirit of gravity, uh, compulsion, dogma, need and consequence and purpose and will and good and evil. So that's just one aspect of, of what he's saying about the spirit of gravity. Um, but that's pretty much the last point that I wanted to bring up. So I'll just yeah. sum summarize that. Uh, what's it called? I mean, I would just say to that, it's like we shouldn't ask how can we make life easier. We should ask how can we have the strength to keep going forward or uh, how can we have the strength to survive the hardness of life because life will never be easy no matter you know um what the innovations the achievements and all of that life will always be hard you know so it's it's how can we how can life be easier but how can we have the strength to overcome the difficulties of life and I think that's a very important question to ask yourself, right? Because we're programmed for comfort. And because of that, we've been able to achieve crazy things. Because we wanted to achieve that safety and, and protection from the the unpredictable nature of, of the world, you know? So it's... Uh, and that's what, you know... Uh, you know... Pr allows us to progress right is we're built for survival and overcoming the odds and um there's got to be an end point to that where it's like we uh i'm not sure where i'm going with that but basically uh we're, we're these amazing creatures built for survival and it's like it it's so easy to become content and we've given many examples of why contentness leads to one's downfall and you you've got to persevere so basically don't ask for an easy life ask for a, a hard life but the strength to endure very true the words to live by people i like that yeah all right ben it has been a wonderful podcast so far and uh the viewers who are listening any questions, any points, or any discrepancies in our thought processes, please let us know. Also, uh, recommendations. You know, if the if the audience would like us to go over certain material, it doesn't have to be Nietzsche, it could be anything. Uh, cultural phenomena or different readings, different authors, you know, feel free. We're, uh, we are taking, we're taking all requests. All right, dense thinkers outer. All right, that's right, boys and girls. See you later.